to another D&D Stories. I am your host, T the Writer, and this is the show where I sit here in front of a shelf full of gaming stuff and tell you all my gaming stories. Now, topic of the day today is this. This fell into my lap last night during a board gaming kind of thing, and I've done a bit of research about it and found out that it's actually very rare, very valuable, and I've never seen it in quite this good a condition before, so I wanted to share it with you guys. I borrowed it from its owner um, with her permission. And I had to, I just, you know, you have to do a D&D story about this kind of thing. So, you know, here I am. I did a little research online. I found out that it's worth uh, $300 plus to, like, the right people. So, you know, I got the fucking latex gloves and everything to go with it. These might be too small for me. Shit. I don't know. I got big hands, girls. <laughs> um, but yeah, this kind of thing does not fall into my lap every day. And you know, I play indie games where you know it's 50, 60, 80 bucks per title and then something like this falls into my lap and I'm like, oh my god, what the hell. And most of the time when I saw this being sold on Amazon, it was, you know, all the pieces were in baggies, you know, there was minimum wear and tear on the box, um, all that kind of thing. And I opened this one up, and I looked inside, and the pieces have not been punched out of their little cardboard things yet. The maps still creak because they've not been opened enough times to not creak and all that kind of stuff, so I'm, I'm being very careful because this is a collector's item and I've not been able to handle something like this before. So I know you're about to explode, what the fuck is under the sheet here? It is the Lord of the Rings War of the Ring game, one of the original box art versions from way the frick back in the day. Look at this. Look at that old artwork. Like, look at the Balrog. You can't even see him. And you know, you've got the you've got the old uh, the old pictures from the original sets of artwork. What do we got here? We got uh, Frodo and Gandalf, and I think uh, yeah, Gollum's over here. Back when Gollum was like super super froggy and stuff like that, he wasn't quite just like a shrunken person. There's a uh, the Lord of the Nazgul, and just like the original artwork is amazing. I almost, like I said, I don't want to touch this barehanded because it's, it's just so old. It's, it was published in 1977. This is a, a board game. This particular version is pushing 40 years old. And there are several, several, trust me, uh, War of the Ring games. There's there's a modern version, you know, there's an old version, there's this version, there's a white box version. Uh, it's been through almost as many iterations as D&D &D has. So this, I'm not sure if it's like the first version or maybe the second one. There's a collector's edition out there. This is one of the normal ones, but I looked on Amazon and, and eBay and stuff and Without the pieces being punched out, 300, 350 bucks, easy. So I was given the opportunity to examine this and like look through it because I'm into all this nerdy bullshit for a D&D &D story. So, you know, thank you, Jenny. Uh, let's see what kind of trouble we can get into and not, uh, not like wreck anything. There is a little bit of damage on the box. You can see down here it's kind of frayed out a little, but that's mostly just from, uh, you know, it being 40 years old and sitting on a on a bench. There's somewhere along the bottom uh, artwork here just like from being moved around or having books stacked on it, but otherwise it's in pretty damn immaculate condition. So uh, let's, let's turn it over just real quick so you guys can see. Holy crap, it's all text. Look at that. Maybe Tolkien wrote the wrote the board game as well. It's just got this tiny little picture up here to show you that it's a hex game. So it comes with hex maps. Let's see what it says. Um, War of the Ring, a designer's edition fantasy simulation game based on J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. 
Uh, the Council of Elrond has convened. Representatives of all the free peoples have come to find a way out of the terror of Sauron's lengthening shadow. Nine are chosen from among the hobbits, men, dwarves, and elves to embark on a perilous errand. So, okay, we're going to follow the movie, I guess. Uh, or, well, you know what I mean. Follow the books. I'm, that was insulting. I'm sorry. Follow the books. I can't believe I said that. My God. Uh, a perilous errand to destroy the One Ring, the great ring of power that embodies so much of the Dark Lord's strength by casting it into the fires of Mount Doom. As the Fellowship make their way south, the call to war comes to Gondor. The long, long the bastion of the Western defense, the once mighty empire has waned under the constant pressure from Mordor's threats and under the generations-long absence of, their, of her king. Now, as the Dark Host threatens to overwhelm her, Gondor calls to her allies, the Riders of Rohan, to aid her in the final conflict. Allies of the Dark Lord pour into Mordor by the thousands, mustering for the great onslaught, while, G while into Gondor come the few, the mere hundreds who can be spared by other fiefdoms. The great city of Minas Tirith, with its seven great walls and its impregnable citadel, awakes at the awaits the attack with too few men, too few swords, and too little hope. Meanwhile, Frodo and his inseparable companion Sam have made their way far to the south. There's a lot of text on this box. Uh, the storm breaks over Minas Tirith. Hosts of orcs, trolls, and fierce men of Harad burst into the hapless city. Uh, the men of Rohan have fallen upon their flank, hewing their way through the very heart of the Dark Lord's army. The whereabouts of the Ringbearer are unknown. The forces of the Dark Lord are gathering still more strength. All depends on the fate of the Ring. The nobles and heroes within the city decide that a final... a final sortie, S-O-R-T-I-E, is the only choice left. There's a vocab word I don't know. In hopes that the Ringbearer will somehow complete his onerous task. Several thousands march from the city to engage the countless thousands of the enemy. The heroes of the West stand fast before the gate of Moranon as the dark host pours forth around them. The might of the West is great even at its ebb, but the enemy is irresistible. Huh. Mount Doom far in, the far in the distance rocks the earth with violent explosions. Somehow, at the very last instant, the ring bearer has succeeded. The ring has departed Middle-earth, and with it goes the power of its maker. Huh. Okay, and then here at the bottom we've got another, uh, another little box. Let's see. This game is a simulation of fictional events. It is played on a map showing the entire area of Middle-earth over which the War of the Ring raged in the Third Age. A grid of hexagons is superimposed over the terrain to regulate movement. So, yeah, it's a hex map. The pieces in the game represent various military units and characters who played a role in Tolkien's fantasy war. The large numbers on the pieces indicate the relative strengths and abilities of these units. Each player maneuvers, maneuvers his pieces on the map in turn. Then the units of both sides must may engage in battle when they occupy the same hex. Makes sense. The total relative strengths of the involved units are compared along with various modifications for terrain and special character abilities. The players consult the appropriate tables, so yeah, it's, it's a war game. I get it. Oh, a buyer's guide for the Lord of the Rings. Uh, two to three players, 12 years old through adult. The average playing time is from 1 to 3.5 hours. The complexity rating is a 5.8. What the hell does that mean? It's like, how would you rate your game on a scale of 1 to 10 in terms of complexity? I'll give mine a 5.8. The fuck does that mean? Uh, the acceptability rating is new game. Oh, note. There's a note for this. Complexity and acceptability are rated on a 1 to 9 scale. 9 indicates the most complex and most highly accepted. Average ratings would be 5 to 6, respectively. 
Ratings based upon regular surveys of more than 30,000 readers of the Strategy and Tactics magazine. Oh, well there you go. I love it when things explain themselves. Product of Simulations Publications in New York. So wow, that, that told us a lot just reading the freaking back. Which I guess, yeah, if you're gonna make a Lord of the Rings game, it's gonna be during the War of the Ring, which, you know, why would you play any other time period unless you wanted to see, like, the world destroying dragons or the, or, you know, the fall of, uh, the fall of the Mines of Moria and stuff like that. You know, you would want to, to play during the, the War for the Ring. Let's see. Inside of the box doesn't look too bad. There's a little bit of uh, ink on the inside of the covers here, but that's just from opening it and closing it X number of times. It's not ripped except for this one corner, which I imagine is because it's almost 40 years old. So let's take a look. We've got uh, a roll book, which is in pristine condition. Like I said, this, this game has never been played. So everything in here is going to be new and shiny. So, you know, I, I never thought I would be doing an unboxing kind of video, but this is, this is a, uh, a rare exception. What is this? A complaint card. This game came with a complaint card. What is this? Dear customer, before playing your new SPI game, please carefully inspect all the components to check that everything is undamaged and that all the parts are included. Was there a chance that I'm not going to get all the stuff I need? What? If any of the parts of your game are missing or damaged, please use this card to describe your complaint and we'll gladly replace the missing or damaged components. In order to properly and speedily service your problem, we must have all the information requested. Huh. So if you're like missing shit or if it looks wrong, that's kind of neat. Where's this? SBI customer service. I bet you this place doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> 1977 has not been kind to games like this. What else we got in here? And I know the, the gloves are kind of much, but it's a $300 game, so I'm, I don't want to even touch it because it's, it's, uh, it's still the way it was when it was made. The damage to the box is the only indication that this thing has left the factory. What we got here? The Worlds of Simulation Gaming. Ah, look at that. It's a little, like, pamphlet thing. Uh, uh, science Fiction and Fantasy. From SBI, great games that let you recreate the conflicts of real and imaginary history. Science Fiction and Fantasy, Lord of the Rings. Um, from the world of J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings to a fantastic universe of wizards and conjured armies from the galaxy-spanning starships of the 25th century to the super soldiers of the future, SBI offers the greatest and most exciting selection of science fiction and fantasy games. Modern and Hypothetical. From the Soviet invasion of Europe to the many clashes of the Arabs and Israel. Isra Israelis. God, stumbled over that. SBI has pioneered the simulation of present day or near future warfare, says we from the late 70s. World War II and the 19th century. The most extensive and intensive treatments of the Second World War and the great 19th century battles that marked the dawn of modern warfare. Holy crap, and I'm, I'm not going to be able to put these on a scanner or anything, you guys, so take take a good look, because I don't want to flatten these out and, and, like, damage them or anything. So it's just like, it's a little, it's a little ad kind of thing. I have to be very careful, because I don't want to damage anything. Oh, okay, it's a, uh, God, it's so old, I can feel how brittle it is. It's a, uh, it's an advertisement for other SBI games. Let's see. Dreadnought. The surface combat in the battleship era. 
for nine bucks. Not bad. The next war, modern conflict in Europe. 28 bucks. Uh, Sorcerer, conflict in the age of magic. Star Force, Alpha Centauri. I've played Alpha Centauri on the computer. What is this one? Nine bucks also. Starships flash across the light years to do combat with human and non-human adversaries. SBI's popular science fiction blockbuster. I mean, obviously none of these are games because, you know, the modern era of video games began in 1987 and this was 1977. So, Swords and Sorcery for 13 bucks. Quest and Conquest in the Age of Magic. A detailed fantasy world provides background for this individualized multiplayer game that recreates the fantasy genre. The whole fantasy genre? The whole thing? Okay. Wait a second. War of the Ring is on here twice. Look at this. There's, oh god, don't, don't crinkle. There we go. War of the Ring is here. See it? And it's down here as well. It's on here twice. Let's see. What's the difference? One of them is 20 bucks and one of them is 15. Let's see. Middle Earth, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, includes the War of the Ring campaign game plus two of plus two individual battle games drawn from the extremely popular... Okay, so it's... Okay, so it's War of the Ring, and it's Gondor, and it's Sauron. So there's more maps for five bucks. Not bad. Considering how DLC goes nowadays, that's not bad at all. Uh, the War of the Ring, beautifully and richly detailed simulation of the fantasy world of Middle-earth. Individual characters and magic cards, combat between armies and individuals. Okay, so it's a little, it's an order form. Got it. And games used to come with these all the time. And some of them probably still do. Like when I, when I got Talisman and um, Dragon Quest and Agrigola, they all come with those big thick books full of artwork from like other games and things so that you get interested in more of their stuff. <laughs> what the hell is this? It's a little baggy. And there's, there's a tiny, tiny D6 in there. Look at that. <laughs> I've, I've got a regular D6. Hang on. It's so little. Where is it? Oh, come on. Give me a D6. Here we go. It's like, look, look at this. This is a little dinky D6. <laughs> I guess they didn't want to give us a full-sized one. And they gave us this giant bag to keep them in. To keep it in. I don't know. Oh, well, actually, this is probably for the other pieces as well, because you have to punch them out, but that's, that's funny. I always laugh at small dice, because whenever you're at a table setting, you have to have dice big enough that people, other people besides you can read them. You know, that's why I don't use, like, I have this giant D20, um, and, and just in comparison, you know, I have this giant D20, but I don't use it because it's dark blue, with dark blue numbers, so I can pull it and be like, oh, 17, and, but it just says 7, you know? I have to get one with, like, contrasting numbers, so. Or contrasting numbers and background. Okay, so now into the really not-supposed-to-be-touchy part. Uh, just got to make sure I've got enough room. And we'll go through the rule book in just a minute, but I just, I just want to kind of unbox the whole thing and see what all's in here. And again, respect for somebody else's property. This is not mine. Uh, what have we got here? These are not punched out, so this is just the way it came. Let's see. Urukai, four to five. Orcs, 25 times four. Haradrim, 15 minus five. Gollum, Gollum is the only yellow piece. That's funny. I gotta be so careful with this. I can feel it moving around. See? See in the corner there? Gollum is the only yellow piece. I guess, you know, he's he's super important, so he's gotta be a different thing. And they're all just little cardboard squares. Um, I guess since it's a big, like, hex game, you can't, you obviously can't make that many 
plastic minis without shooting the price of the game through the roof because you know we've all bought like Risk and some of those other games that come with tons of pieces and the reason it's excuse me the reason it's so expensive is because it's got nice wooden pieces or it's got all the little individual guys let's see oh and the sections are labeled okay the forces of Sauron men the forces of Sauron orcs and trolls the forces of Sauron men Gollum yeah turn this over real quick oh okay so there's other factions here Elves, Western Allies, Dwarves, Rohirrim, which, which is the writers of Rohan, Gondorians, Forces of Saruman, and Chief of the D.N. Lendings. I don't know what that is. Orakai, Orcs, Writers of Rohan. Oh, there's everybody. Gandalf the Grey, Gandalf the White, Gimli, Legolas, Boromir, Aragorn, Sam, and they're just little squares. They don't look like anything. I guess you were really supposed to use your imagination back then. Um, and this is folded in half, but I don't, I'm not brave enough to unfold it. So, you know, take a, take a look. It looks like a periodic table, doesn't it? And the gold ones here are the, uh, the Fellowship. So I guess they're really, really easy to spot because, you know, they're the, they're the main characters. But they've got, like, the elves up here are green, and then the, uh, the dwarves are light green, and the riders of Rohan are light blue and stuff like that. So it's just, it's these tiny, tiny punch-out um, cardboard things. I'm very scared of that because it's got so many pieces, and I don't want to punch any of them out. Okay, what do we got here? These look like character portraits. Um, they might be trading cards. They look like trading cards. Let's see. Thranduil, Theodred, Nazgul number five, Nazgul number four, Gothmog, Lord of the Nazgul, Eowyn, Dane, Gimli, Legolas, yeah, Boromir, Aragorn, yeah. These are the uh, the character portraits, I guess. So whenever you go somewhere, you've got all these freaking pictures to look at. So you know, up here in the top corner, we've got Boromir. That's that's Boromir for this game. You know, and I'm sorry if the lighting is bad or if it's struggling to focus, but it's very interesting. Like when it came out, kind of artwork. You know, here's you know, right next to him is is freaking Legolas. You know, there's Legolas there in the middle, and uh, you know, Gimli and and Aragorn are down here. So stuff like that. So there's something on the back of them though. Let's see. I'm so scared of handling something this old and this valuable. So faith was p placed in me to make sure it didn't nothing bad happened. What are these? Oh, here's Gandalf the White. I'm looking at the backs of them now. Uh, the Fellowship, Gandalf the White, card number 10. Combat 2, Morale 4, Endurance 6, Ring Rating 3, Capture Escape 1 slash 1, Sorcery A. Replaces Gandalf the Grey if he is killed. Makes sense. So these are stat cards. Okay, so there's armies like the orcs and the dwarves and the riders of Rohan. And then there's individual characters that get their own. Where's Gimli? I always liked him. Yeah, here we go. Fellowship, Gimli, card number eight. Dwarf of the Kingdom Under the Mountain. Combat three, morale two, endurance six, ring rating of four. Capture is two, escape is four. His morale is in quotes, that's funny. Just because of how, what an ornery, surly guy he is. Lord of the Nazgul. Can only be wounded by an elven blade or sorcery. And he can search. Okay. I guess the other 
the other Nazgul can't search. What is Nazgul number three can only be wounded by an elven blade or sorcery and can search. Some of these don't have extra things on them. Let me see. Where's where's Frodo? I want to see Frodo's stats. It looks like there's several of these, so let me let me gently set this aside. It looks it looks like the backs of these. You're either not supposed to know who they are, or oh, these are something else. Oh, there's Sting. Okay. Elven short sword adds one to the combat value of any individual hobbit in possession of it. Okay. Galad Galadriel's light, elven light. A character with possession of it may, along with any accompanying characters, be moved through any tunnel at the cost of two movement. Also, a character in possession of it has one added to his combat value in any combat with Sh Shelob. Sh Shalab, Shelob, the big spider. So where's Frodo? Or do we not get to play as him because he's he's not a part of the war for the ring? Maybe I missed him. Hang on. Brand, Eu, and Dane, Gimli, Legolas, Boromir. Frodo Baggins, here he is. He's he's right there. He's got kind of a surly look on his face. Let's see. The Fellowship, card number three, Frodo Baggins, a hobbit. Combat one, morale three, endurance four, ring rating of five. I bet he's the only one with a ring rating of five. <laughs> Boromir has a ring rating of zero, and he can seize the ring, it says at the bottom. <laughs> Huh, okay. So let's... So what was I looking at over here? What are these? These are like items and things? This is kind of like D&D, &D, just on a bigger scale. Servants of Sauron, the Balrag. Balrog. Demon of Morgoth. Combat 4, Morale 4, Endurance 6. Minus 3 on Sorcery die rolls. So, you know, the weakness for magic, I guess. And again, he's just he's just a black shape with a sword and a whip. Which which yeah, that's what they described him as. But he looks so goofy compared to like the modern iteration that we have now. I hope that's focusing correctly. But he's just like a black shape. I guess we're supposed to imagine how terrifying he is. Like this version doesn't have wings or demon horns or anything. He's just just big. Oh, Lemba's bread. Huh? Uh, you know, remember, we've still got more elven Lemba's bread. Any one group of characters can be moved for one game turn through any terrain except impassable at the cost of one movement point per hex. Lemba's can only be used once in any game. Removed from play after use. Huh. What else we got? Elven cloak, elven rope. Glamdring, the elven sword. Enduriel, the elven sword. Shadowfax, the great horse of Rohan. Any character in position of Shadowfax can be moved up to eight movement points per game turn. Show us the meaning of haste. No hobbit can ride or possess Shadowfax, but the horse can carry one hobbit in addition to any non-hobbit. That's funny. Okay, so I guess these are items and, and special enemies. Set those over here. And there, here's another... another. Uh, I don't want to bend anything. Here's another sheet of them. Let's see. They say event on the back. Let's see. Rohan mobilizes. And that's all it says. Oh, there's others with more. Dead Man of Dunharrow. For any two combat, army combat die rolls, add or subtract three. Orcs in a state of battle frenzy. Any player may cause the die roll to be 
for any in combat involving orcs to be either increased or decreased by two. Huh. So these are just like things that can happen. Interesting. Okay. What else we got? Oh, more events. Okay, let's see. And they're 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 really nothing special to look at. I know I should be showing you these more, but it you know it doesn't really look like anything. It's very primitive, very very old, and it's just plain text. There's no, there's hardly any artwork. You know, there's it's just text on things that happen, and you have to use your imagination. There's a little bit of artwork on the pink ones, but um, shoot, oh, that's coming across right. There we go. But uh. This was a really, I guess if you were going to sell all this for 15 bucks, you'd make them out of pretty cheap materials. Uh, more event cards over here. I guess you'd have to make a bunch of event cards, kind of like the Talisman Adventure cards. You'd have to make a bunch of these, but they would all be events that take place during the War of the Ring. Yeah, this one says, Eagles! with an exclamation. Any one character... Any one captured character or group in one hex may escape and be placed immediately in either W2812 or W3013. I guess those were locations. Um, wow. Fierce Storms. Elven, bo Elven boats or Corsairs of Umbar may not be played this turn. Pipeweed Cash is discovered. No hobbits can be moved more than two X's by the Fellowship player this game. Orcs argue over the fate of captives. Any captured characters in a particular one hex can be autom can automatically escape during the Fellowship player's movement. So this is really close to, to everything that happened. You know, a lot of love, you know, despite all the bland artwork and cheap cards. A lot of love went into the content, I can tell that. Okay, now to the big important part, the uh, the boards. Now there's, you know, it's it's taken up easily 80% of the box. So this board is either huge or there are several of them. Okay, gotta be so careful. This game's almost 40 years old. Okay, that's just one of them apparently. There's several in there. Okay. This ain't your daddy's DM screen. Well, it might be. Actually, it's almost four years old. Okay. I don't even want to press on it to make it lay flat. I just want to open it. Oh, wow. Okay. War of the Ring. What does it say? It's written in some form of Elvish. It's the West map. So it's like a... It's a big hex grid, and every hex is marked with a, uh, a number. 0405, 2409. I, there's probably a pattern to it. I'm, just, I'm looking at it upside down. I'm going to show it to you guys. So it's, you know, I don't want to straighten it out because it might damage something. But, you know, look, it's, it's a map. I mean, it's, it's a hex map with all the different things and stuff on it. Mountains and regions and things that are marked roads. The misty passes. Let's see what else we got here. Far downs, the tower hills. Okay, so these are all these are all maps. Okay, so let's put this one away before I mess it up. Okay, let's try this one. Ooh, easy, easy. You have no idea how nerve-wracking this is, by the way. This is basically a collector's item. And, you know, that no, I'm not going to do a review on it, because that would involve opening it and punching out all the stuff and ruining the collector's value of the, of the thing. So, let's see what's on this one. Oh, don't cry. I hope the camera can hear that. Okay. This is the, the terrain key, it looks like. There's where it's, it's showing us what everything means on the map, so we can get all the, uh, what all the hexes are for. 
and there's also places for cards. Uh, the Servant of Sauron, who is in Hex 2912, The Misty Passes. The Servant of Sauron in Mirkwood. The Servant of Sauron in The Black Gate. Okay. One magic, magic card in Baradur. Magic card in Thranduil's Palace. Two magic cards in Minas Tirith. Okay, so that's where you can find magic items and stuff. Got it. So there's there's like this this little sideboard here for uh, enemies that are in certain locations that were in the books, along with where you can find like magic items and things because they're stored in specific locations. You know, I guess you couldn't really pick like a random hex unless you had like a DM. You know, which I don't think this game would have, but. I've yet to open the rule book, so who knows. Let's see. There's a circle that says shadow points, and then next to it there's a thing called search cards. Place the place deck on this space and draw from the bottom of the deck. Place the used cards face up on top. Hmm. Let's see. The turn record track. Starts on the 25th of... Desmeter 3018 TA, which I guess is their calendar. You know, I, I have not actually read the Lord of the Rings books. Um, I actually have um, the original, like, when it was published, the, you know, when it was originally came out, it was one book, you know? And then, because modern reading dictates trilogies and things like that. It was split into three books. It was actually published as one book, so I have the one book to rule them all. But, um... And I know there's at least one Lord of the Ring buff who is just, like, slapping his forehead at all my mispronunciations and things, so... Uh, so apparently that's, like, the sideboard where all the, all the cards and stuff go. What else do we have? Oh, last. Oh, there's two more. Okay, what do we got? Uh, the War of the Ring, the east part of the map. So, you know, more hexes, more, more stuff. You know, I don't even want to fold it out all the way. It's... Hope you can see that okay. I know the lighting's probably bad. There we go. So it's just, you know, it's more, more map. Probably this one, too. There's a west map, an east map. This is probably the south map. I don't know. It doesn't say. <laughs> the Crack of Doom. The Baradur Black Tower. I don't recognize any of these places because I haven't read Lord of the Rings yet, but... Should they ever refer to these places, you know, here they are. Um, and I don't know, I guess, like, maybe mountains are impassable, or you can use those to, to bunker down in, things like that, but... I don't know. So that's everything that's in the box. So let's let's look at the, uh, the, the rule book here. And again, you can see how primitive this art book is. It's... It's all grayscale. You can't even see, like, the Balrog, what it's supposed to look like. It's like, it could be Syndrome with, with that kind of shaping. It kind of does look like Syndrome. It's, it's big and round, and it's got the hair. <laughs> so he's got the flaming sword, and he's got the cat of nine tails. And, you know, there's, there's freaking... I guess that's Gandalf. I don't know. While everybody else is running, and then there's... Yeah, so this is the scene from the Mines of Moria when he's, uh getting ready to fight the, the Balrog while everybody else runs away. So. Probably the best, probably the best piece of art in this whole game is the cover of the rule book. So what do we got in here? How to read the rules. Oh, I gotta see this. The best way to use the rules for the War of the Ring is a reference while playing the game. Read them through and acquire some familiarity so that you know, for example, that when Gandalf gets involved in a fight, he can utilize sorcery. Imagine that. Then, if and when the situation arises, you can refer to the appropriate section of the rules and learn precisely 
what he can accomplish thereby. It will be easier to play through the game this way even though you would have to refer to the rule book several times the first time you play it. That's what most people do. Um, however, none of the rules are too difficult and after a few turns you will find that the event cards are self-explanatory and the game flows smoothly. We heartily recommend you try this approach. Who is writing this? God, okay. There's no artwork anywhere. Let me see. Introduction. War of the Ring is basically a two-player game concerning the struggle between Sauron, the Dark Lord, and the free peoples of Middle-earth at the end of the Third Age, as recounted in the Lord of the Rings book. The Dark Power player controls the forces of Sauron and his allies, and the Fellowship player is in command of the coalitions of elves, dwarves, men, and hobbits. Is this really only for two players? Didn't it say? Oh, yep. Yeah, two or three players. Wow. Huh. Most war games that I've seen are like five or six players. Um, each player can move and direct in combat the pieces representing individual characters who took part in the struggle. The Dark Power player can win either by gaining control of Middle or Middle Earth by force of arms or by seizing the ruling ring, thereby attaining sufficient power to assure the supremacy of the will of Sauron. Makes sense. Um, how to set up the character game. The Dark... Oh. Before setting up the War of the Ring, the players should determine which side each of them will play. No shit. Then, in accordance with the following section, they should prepare the game map, the cardboard playing pieces, and the cards for play. This is probably the driest, most uninteresting... I mean, I'm, I can show it to you, but there's really nothing to look at. It's all text, you know, and there's a little picture in the corner. So it's, it's very odd to see what game manuals looked like. I mean, it's, it's like if you get a, a newspaper from the 1970s, the print is tiny and there's like six columns, especially like the New York Times. Look up an old copy of the New York Times. They cram stuff in and there was just tiny, tiny pictures here and there, you know? And you can't even hardly tell what they are. You know, there's pictures of, of the hobbits down here and stuff like that. Meanwhile, it's explaining, you know, all the characters and what they do and how they work. It's basically the same on every page. It's six columns and a couple of pictures. My god! It's like the granddaddy of indie games. Endurance charts. Oh, okay, so it, it comes with, like, Yahtzee pages. Look at this. With little boxes for you to check off and look at. Huh. What do we got here? The Fellowship, the West, Sauron's forces, the servants of Sauron, Sauron's forces, and the variable loyalty of Gollum. Well, that's something specific to keep. So I guess you would make copies of this, because there's like six of the same thing here, where it shows their endurance points. Nazgul can be killed only by sorcery or elven blades. It's got that written everywhere. Let's see. War of the Ring charts and tables. Terrain effects. Shadow points. Control of Gollum. Gollum... If Gollum was controlled by the Dark Power player on the previous game turn, add one Rai one to the die roll, treating the result of seven as a six. If Gollum was controlled by the Fellowship, subtract one. If Gollum becomes neutral, the player holding Gollum's card retains the card, but does not control Gollum. If Gollum switches allegiance to the player not holding his card, the card must be given over. So Gollum goes back and forth, just like in the story. I gotta say it it looks interesting, but based on the pieces that I'm looking at, it probably doesn't hold up well. 
especially with people like me who are who are like spoiled with uh, with like Pathfinder pieces and shit. Probably not the best uh, thing to. Uh, what do we got here? More endurance level charts, individual combat results. How magic cards may be exchanged between characters. I'll trade you my Elish Norn for a Hellkite Dragon. Except not really, because Elish Norn is way better, but... Huh. And here it has like a couple of paragraphs for each and every magic item that we looked at, like the ring, uh, shadow facts, the elven cloak and elven rope, mithril mail. It's, it's, again, it's, it's straight up text with, with little bitty pictures on it. So it's, it's not like anything interesting to look at. I don't know if you guys are having any fun listening to me look through this and kind of mumble, but there's not, there's not a ton to look at here. It's very much imagination based. Uh, stuff, especially if your army is going to be a bunch of red squares and stuff like that. I mean, even Risk had like cannons and dudes and what horses, I think. Something like that. I don't know. It's just straight up text. Like, this would be a lot of reading to, to learn to play this game. Oh, the designer's notes. I always love this. Designer's notes. As expected, there are a number of problems in doing a simulation on a well-known story. When creating a simulation on historical subject matter, one can check his facts and figures through various primary and secondary sources to reconstruct the source of the conflict, the course of the conflict, and even hypothesize alternative courses of strategy and outcomes. In constructing a simulation on The Lord of the Rings, it becomes obvious that Tolkien's novel, or for that matter any novel, addresses itself in a continuous storyline with only hints of possible alternative outcomes. Proceedings in that line of thought we had to postulate on what could happen and give the players the option of exploring various paths of alternate actions. So, what if, in other words. Lord of the Rings is distinguished by the fact that it is not only widely read, but almost committed to memory by many Tolkien devotees. Obviously, many trained eyes will be scrutinizing the game for flaws, so the research was of paramount importance. Again, we ran into the problem that there is only one book, Lord of the Rings. But, yeah, see, 1977, there was only one book. You know, it was, it was the big brick. You know, it, it wasn't a trilogy, that was just, you know, the three acts. In fact, The Lord of the Rings was actually going to have different titles at first. It was, it was, uh, like, The Ring Goes North, The Ring Goes East, The Ring Goes South, The Ring Goes West. That, that was going to be, like, the names of the episodes, and he had to be convinced otherwise to name them something more interesting. Um... There's only one book, The Lord of the Rings, but fortunately we did run across two important secondary sources that were extremely helpful. The Guide to Middle-Earth and The Tolkien Companion, both of which are a type of encyclopedic glossary of the Tolkien works. The essence of the book is in its, is in its characters, and we had to integrate as many of them as possible, but we also knew that not all would make it without cluttering up the game. Our regards to Radagast the Brown, Treebeard, and etc. Since the characters... I love Radagast. That's who they use for somebody they cut out. Since the characters would be the focal point of the game, it was obvious decision to start to... From the start to individualize characters, giving them their all their attributes so that we could develop the character confrontations. The classics ones, and the what would happen if ones. Aragorn versus the Balrog, etc. Well, Aragorn would get fucking crushed under his boot, that, or under his heel, that's how. The power of the author in a novel is supreme, for he can create disasters for his protagonist and just to suddenly deliver them from the jaws of certain death. That power has been transmitted into the game in the order for the players to relive all the excitement and drama of the story. Not with this primitive artwork, they're not. 
this has been conveyed through the use of the event cards, and but it was left in the hands of the players to use them judiciously throughout the game to help themselves or to carry their opponents. The event cards rely heavily on the adventures and escapades that are sprinkled throughout the course of the overall story. The Misty Mountain passes, Boromir's attempt to seize the ring, the Ents, the Dead Men of Dunharrow, all have an important role in the story and their place in the game has had to be secured. Again, latitude was taken for the incorporation of additional events and the timing of play of the events. This was done for play value. The recurring thought was not to make the game a carbon copy of the book, otherwise it would not become a game, nor a true simulation where various strategies or options could be taken. And again, that was the intention. Create the framework of Tolkien and allow the players to follow the book exactly, or as closely as possible, but also to explore alternatives. Huh. So it's very wordy. Um, and again, like I said, it's, it's text all the way through. I mean, I've not run into a game with this many rules that's not like the tabletop RPGs that we usually talk about. So it's very... Very odd. I, I mean, there's there's such a thing as window of relevance, and then there's, like, changing what gaming means over 40 years. Like, a lot of imagination. This was... This is a lot of text. And, and I imagine it would be kind of similar, like, playing this now would be similar to, like, playing a tabletop version of, uh, of like, A Song of Ice and Fire. You need to gather up you know, five or six nerds that have read A Song of Ice and Fire and then try to place them in that fantasy world and not tell the exact same story. I mean, they'll come in with expectations, but this is, this is a lot of reading, a lot of raw materials that honestly could have been way better. But again, this is the late 70s, so I don't know what I'm complaining about. Uh... It was really interesting, though. Isn't this neat? And this is like a like a collector's item. Like I said, I got onto Amazon and eBay and stuff. This is like 150 bucks for this in bad condition. And then there's others that are in excellent condition but have all the stuff poked out, you know, out of these little uh, square cardboard things. And they're worth like 300 plus dollars. Uh, I may have to do some research if the owner of this game wants to sell it for like profit to see how well this would sell if if it's just completely intact you know like I said I'm, I'm very frightened of this piece because it's I don't want anything to fall out is that all the pieces? yeah it is so you know you put the put this back on top but you know holy crap isn't this cool you know it's it's almost like opening the original red box and looking at all the old artwork and stuff so it's War of the Ring from 1977. That is just cool. So, uh, I hope I hope that was interesting to you guys. But holy crap, we got to look through something you know 37 years old. Holy shit, that is really cool. So, I hope you guys had as much fun as me. I need to get these gloves off. God, I hope you guys had as much fun as me. And I will see you guys on the next D and D stories. Keep gaming. Hey guys, thanks for watching. Be sure to check out my audio novel, Cyranox the Feared, and look at the Redbubble website for some D&D Stories t-shirts. Don't forget to hit the like button, and keep gaming.